a good turnout. I see a, a few familiar faces um, seen some of my classes. Um, so I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Hassan Michelini and I'm the Associate Director of the Center for Languages and Intercultural Communication and I also teach Arabic language and culture here at the center. And with me is Heather Lazar who's going to come in a minute. Which she's going to come in, in a minute. Um, she is our center. Um, uh, she's our program administrator and she's Hi Heather, I was just introducing you actually. I was introducing myself and then I was saying this is, uh, with me today is Heather Lazar, who is um, our uh, program administrator, and she's very knowledgeable about our various course offerings. And so I'm relying on her help um, if you have any questions that I don't know the answer to. Um, we have some swag here that we're gonna give out at the end of, um, of today's session. Um, and so let me go ahead and get started. Um, the Center for Languages and Intercultural Communication um, offers courses in 10 different languages um, from the beginner level all the way to the advanced or post-advanced level, depending on the language. And this is what we're gonna cover today. You're here to um, learn more about the certificate that we offer, so we're gonna talk a little bit about what the certificate is, what is the purpose of the certificate, what are the requirements to get the certificate, how to declare the certificate. And I know that you guys um, are at various stages of uh, fulfilling the requirements for the certificate. Um, then I'm gonna uh, give you a few useful resources um, so that you can research things on your own. Uh, but I will say this now, that um, I encourage you to reach out to me if you have any questions, because as you will see in a minute, there is no single pathway to getting the certificate, right? Um, you can personalize your coursework based on your interests, and I encourage you to do so. And then we're gonna hear um, one testimonial from, is Giovanni here? No, he's not here yet, maybe he'll come later today. All right, okay. Um, so what is the FLIC certificate? The Certificate for Languages and Intercultural Communication is the only um, academic credential that we offer at FLIC. Uh, we do not offer um, any minors or majors. Um, however, this is not a freestanding degree in the sense that you cannot declare the certificate without having already declared your major. Uh, we offer the certificate in um, 10 different languages. Um, some of these are modern languages, and others are um, less commonly taught languages like Arabic or Korean or um, Chinese and so on. Um, the purpose of the certificate is to offer you rigorous training in the target language and culture. Um, so you're not only expected to be a proficient language user, but you're also expected to be knowledgeable about the culture of the language that you speak. You know, the name of our center is Languages and Intercultural Communication. Um, you're also able, by um, obtaining the certificate, to demonstrate your language proficiency in a measurable and quantifiable way. At the end of um, the certificate, so when you have fulfilled the various requirements, the last one, is to take an assessment, and our assessment is based on the Common European Framework of Reference, which is an international um, standard for measuring language proficiency. And finally, you can enhance your employability uh, by taking the certificate. Um, I find this to be particularly useful because many of you after graduation will find it necessary to demonstrate to your potential employer that you know Spanish or that you know Korean. And it might not be sufficient to ask your employer to actually go take a look at your transcript because you did some coursework in Spanish or in Korean. 
Um, instead, you could be, I actually had a degree in um, Spanish or in Korean. I had a certificate in Spanish language and intercultural communication. So that helps a lot in enhancing your employability. Um, these are the requirements. Um, of course, these are um, less than what you would require to do if you were to take a minor, right? Um, so the certificate typically requires less academic work. Um, you have a total of four courses that you have to take in um, the target language. You could take more, but you cannot take less. Uh, there's an experiential learning requirement, and we'll talk about this shortly. And finally, there is an assessment, uh, which consists um, in a take-home test. So we're going to take a look at each of those uh, requirements. For the uh, coursework, there's a minimum of four courses in the target language. And typically, these courses are two courses at the 200 level and two courses at the 300 level. Uh, for a total of 12 credits. So each of these courses are three credits. And all of our language courses are three credits each. Um, now this can vary largely based on your current proficiency level. Uh, many of you have not started taking the language at the 100 level, right? You guys took the placement test and maybe you placed into a 200 or even a 300 level. Um, so the coursework is going to be a little different for you. Uh, and we can take, we can talk more about this. Uh, what is important is that you um, check in with me, you, that you consult with me, if you have any questions about the specific coursework that is needed um, for you to uh, fulfill this requirement. Uh, the experiential learning requirement is our second requirement. Um, typically, the experiential learning, and by experiential learning, we mean that you learn by doing. It's the process of learning by doing something. Um, typically, our students in the past have fulfilled this requirement by going on to the study abroad program. And of course, for obvious reasons, over the past two years, this was not possible. And we also, along the way, figured that many of our students cannot travel abroad because you know, of financial reasons or because they are student athletes and they need to be training here during the summer or because they are taking care uh, of a family member who needs care. So whatever uh, reason there is uh, for which you cannot study abroad, know that there are multiple other options available for you. What we want to make sure that you're doing is that you're using the target language in a structured but spontaneous setting. Um, so let me give you an example. You can do an internship, which could be domestic. You could find a local NGO um, that helps um, Spanish speakers um, who have health issues, right, and do not know the English language and need to communicate with their healthcare providers. Um, you can do that in person. You can do that remotely. I know that Giovanni, that's you, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that you will talk to us shortly about this, uh, the experiential learning component, but towards the end of the, uh, thank you. Um, you can do an apprenticeship, or you can do a volunteer experience. There really are no limits to what you can do to fulfill the experiential learning component. We are also looking into um, having students do projects in their respective colleges, in their respective uh, residential colleges, in the target language. We don't know how that is going to look like yet, but we're continuously looking for ways to ensure that you have what you need to fulfill this um, requirement. The third and last requirement is the assessment. And um, this is the last step. So you would only be able to take the assessment after you have fulfilled uh, the first two requirements. So from the experiential learning component, and you've also taken the required uh, coursework. For the assessment, this is a, a take-home test. Um, so you will be sent a um, link to enroll in a campus course where you will be able to take the, um, the test. And there are three different assessments that you'll be taking online. 
the first one will test your interpersonal skills in the language. How do you communicate in the language? Um, and for that part of the test, that is actually the only part that is not taken on Canvas. You will meet with one of our language consultants, and you will have a you will carry out a role play with them. And this could be anything, uh, right? It, it, it's usually a random topic. Um, it lasts between 10 and 30, 35 minutes maximum, uh, where they will pull out a card randomly and be like, okay, you are in, you are a tenant, and I'm your landlord, and um, there is a broken window in the apartment, and you need to talk to the landlord to get it fixed, and make sure they pay the expense, right? So, and then this is when you um, start explaining what the issue is and negotiate meaning with your landlord. Um, so there is no way to predict the topic of the role play, much less to prepare for it. Um, the second one is the presentational um, assessment. So we want to assess um, your ability to present in the current language. And you do so um, <coughs> with a speaking activity. Um, so you will get a topic and will be asked to prepare a five minute, I think it's a five minute or a seven minute presentation, oral presentation on the topic. And from the moment that you take a look at the prompt on Canvas, you have two days to put together your presentation, record yourself, given the presentation, and then upload it onto Canvas. The same thing also for the writing. So for the writing assessment, um, so really the presentational or the, the presentation portion of the um, assessment is divided into two parts. Speaking, that's the actual representation, and then writing would be required to write a 500 word essay. Um, you will again see the prompt on Canvas, and from the moment you see the prompt, you have one week to um, write your essay and submit it via Canvas as well. Um, there are two testing periods, um, typically at the end of each semester, in December and in April. Um, and so you will have 30 days to complete the, uh, uh, these three different assessments. We typically open um, the um, Canvas website on, um, I'm gonna say end of, beginning of November, right? And then you will have until the last day of instruction, which is December 2nd, to complete the three assessments and submit them. Um, however, we only grade in the spring. So even though you decide to take the assessment in the fall, unless you're graduating um, in the fall, in December, uh, we're not gonna grade your assessment until the end of the spring semester. And the certificate is generally not awarded until you have completed all of your coursework at the university and you have your degree. All right. Um, how to declare the certificate? Um, there are two things that you need to uh, do. I'm actually going to start from here. You need to complete the Google form on our website. If you go to um, the website for our center and then go to the certificate page, it says here for more information, please fill out this Google form. Um, and so we want you to fill out the Google form so that we have your information in our database and we can reach out to you to make sure that you're on track, you're still interested in pursuing the certificate, you're completing the required coursework, um, we'll let you know if any changes are happening in the certificate, and um, we'll also let you know when we have an information session like this so that you can learn more uh, or ask any questions you have about the certificate. The second thing you need to do is to submit the declaration form, um, which you can find in Esther, and this is the same form for the major, minor, or university certificate declaration form. You need to fill it out. And then the second section of the form, I need to um, sign and fill out for you. So you will either send it to me by email, or you can come um, see me in my office here in Razor Hall, and we can talk a little bit if you have other questions, and I can also sign your form for you. Um, a couple of useful resources that I wanted to share with you. 
Um, the first one is the click certificate page, uh, which is where you would have access to the Google form. There's a bunch of very good information about the certificate, a uh, short description of the certificate. However, for the um, latest and most updated information about the certificate, you need to go to the general announcements um, because the university wants all academic programs to have the requirements in the same place, not on, on separate websites, but on this same page for the general announcements. Um, I really like the general announcements page because you can see um, when you go to it, let's see. So when you go to it, you can see that, um, and then you click undergraduate. These are the um, certificates that we offer in 10 different languages. Um, the requirements are the same, but things can vary a little bit from one language to another. So you can click on the language that you're interested in, and then you will see a list of the requirements here. Um, so this is kind of the most um, reliable source um, to look at. Okay, and um, do you have any questions so far? Okay, please. Is there the option or the precedent of people pursuing certificates in multiple languages? Yes, both the option and the precedent, mm -hmm. yes. We have had students in the past who pursued the certificate in two or more languages. You can definitely do so. You will want to also check with me so that we make sure that you're on track. Um, you will have to fulfill the requirements for each one separately, of course. Can you take a look Yes and no. Um, any class that you take abroad could potentially fulfill both requirements um, if the class is taught in the target language and at the level that we want you to be at, which is either a 200 or a 300 year course. Um, now for languages like Spanish, for example, we want students to have a well-rounded knowledge of the region of Spanish-speaking countries. And so uh, we want students to take two or three courses with us here at CLIC, but then move on to the development of modern um, and classical um, literatures and cultures and take at least one of their courses, which is above 330, above the 330 level, or 333, I think. Um, typically, if you have participated in a study level program of more than one week, then that will automatically fulfill the experiential learning component. Uh, but we will need to take a closer look at your coursework to make sure that it's in line with what we do here at Price. Does that make sense? Yes. If you cut it out, let's uh, say you take the LPC subject and you take, you cut it into the 300 level subject. If you take the 300 level subject, would you offer the subject for 300 level No. If you test out of 200 level courses, then you don't get credit for those courses. In other words, you don't get credit for courses that you haven't taken. We want you to take 12 credits of language study. And, and when I say language, it's you know uh, intended as language, culture, literature. And so at that point, you would be, you'd have to take four um, courses at the 300 levels. We have plenty of, uh, we're talking, when you're asking about Spanish language, we have a lot of uh, courses offered either at CLIC or at the CENT or at the MCLC. Uh, the department um, that are at the 300 level. And many of them are very interesting. I found that you know, whether you are a STEM major or a humanities major, you will find something that you can sort of apply to your own major. That's 
a really good question. So for transfer credits earned at other higher education institutions, you can um, have up to six credits count towards the certificate. However, these cannot be high school credits. Uh, they cannot be even advanced placement uh, credits cannot be um, cannot count towards the certificate. Um, <clears throat> but if you decide, for example, to go abroad and you take three courses, each of which is three credits, and you come back and you're like, well, I earned nine credits and I want to have all of them count towards the certificate, you can only have a maximum of six count towards the, the certificate. There was a question here? Yeah. So let me make sure I understand correctly. Um, the person that you're inquiring on their behalf, uh, the, the, were they placed into a 300 level? Yeah. And they took two semesters of 300 level courses, yeah. and then there's only yeah. one at the 400 level. Okay. So, so, they, so they've taken three courses. Oh, they're taking, they're taking two. Yeah. So two courses at the 300 level. No, one at the 400 and one at the 300. Okay, so they got placed into uh, 302, not 301, okay. This is a little tricky. Um, what we typically see, and I can work with them on figuring something out, what we typically see is students who have um, taken three courses, but they have reached uh, the, the maximum number of courses that are offered in the target language. Um, this is especially true for languages like Russian and Arabic, where we don't have academic departments that we work with. Um, for the academic departments that we work with do not necessarily offer courses in our languages, uh, then these students are also allowed to take one course in the English language as long as it has to do with the target culture and civilization. Um, so, and this could be, there's a lot of courses that uh, could count towards um, uh, <coughs> the certificate in English, right? They can um, go to the Department of Political Science or even um, Department of Linguistics it could be anything that's really maybe not linguistics. Um, uh, TAS, Transnational Asian Studies, uh, courses that have to do with Russian language, and, no, not language, culture and civilization or literature, even if they are taught in um, English would count. In your case, you're you're missing two courses, so we need to figure something out with the remaining course. Um, have them reach out to me and we'll, we'll take a look at their exact course work, see what's going on, and then we'll take a look together at the catalog and, and see what's going, what could qualify for that. Heather, is there anything that I'm missing? No, I guess if they have to take this is from a study abroad, because if they do a study abroad, then um, they would obviously get some credits to transfer them to that classes. That would probably be the best solution for them, I think. And, and I understand that studying abroad is not an option for everyone, right? Uh, but if they could do a studying abroad experience, it was, and that's what you were asking about, right? It would, I think, it would, do. Um, it would qualify towards the coursework and also the experiential learning requirement. Um, other question? Yes. When will we get the results? That's a really good question. So the assessment is not a pass or fail um, exam. So if you take the assessment, the outcome is for us to determine your proficiency level, and then we note that on your transcript. So it's, your transcript will come with a nice picture of a certificate, and then there will be an annotation that says so-and-so has completed the um, certificate in Spanish language or Korean language and intercultural communication. Um, and then there would be another note, um, a footnote that says that you are at uh, the B1 level. And when I say B1 or C1 or C2, um, these are the ratings of the um, Common European Framework of Preference that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so this is the scale that we rate you on. But you're not going to fail, no one fails the assessment. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think that accelerated courses, language courses might Okay. <laughs>
yes, in, in the sense that the course itself covers the contents of two classes, right? But we only earn three credits from that course. Am I right, Heather? So it only, it only counts as one <coughs> course for the certificate. Which course is it? An accelerated course. Oh, yes. An accelerated, like if you were to take Portuguese 106 or Italian 106, um, that's just an accelerated course. Yeah. And to, and to give the sense. So it only counts for one of those courses, one of those courses. Correct. But yeah. actually, it's the accelerated course, I think the 106 doesn't even count. Right. Yeah. So it, it still needs to be at the 200 or 300 level that I mentioned here, right? Um, either at the 200 or the 300 level. And to give more context, um, so some language programs, not all language programs, offer an accelerated track for students who already come with either prior knowledge of the language, um, because they are heritage learners, they speak the language at home, or it's a, they know they're very proficient in a language that shares a lot of similarities with the one that they want to study. So for example, if you are a speaker of French, and you're very proficient in French, and you decide that you want to take Italian, you could take accelerated Italian, right? because both Italian and French are um, Roman languages. Um, and the same is true also for Korean. If you know Korean, uh, if you're a heritage speaker, so you already speak Korean at home, then you can take the accelerated track. Am I right, Heather? Yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, are you allowed to take the uh, certification in both of or is it just once? It just once, yeah. So you're not, yeah. We, we only allow you to take it once, and that's why I recommend that you wait until the end um, um, of your coursework when you have taken all the required courses experiential <coughs> component because this is when you feel like your language proficiency is at its best. Because um, you might be thinking, okay, I just finished two or three courses in the language and I feel like I can. I'm pretty solid right now. I can't take the assessment just to get it out of the way. Wait until you have done the experiential learning component, perhaps even a study abroad opportunity. That could help you tremendously. And, and mostly it's because there is no way you can predict what the assessment is going to look like and or prepare for it. Um, there is no way you can study for the test. Other questions? Is there a duration requirement for the experience of learning when you are volunteering? You can do that. Um, I didn't hear the first part of the is question. Is there like a duration requirement? Like how long you have to do something for it? You're doing it like volunteering for a couple of months, like four months or seven months. Yes. So we want you to use the language for a minimum of 60 hours. And what we have typically seen in the past is that students will do volunteer work for a total of <coughs> um, six weeks or 10 hours um, each week. So that adds up to 60 hours. But you can also do two or more uh, volunteer work. Um, so you can, I know that, maybe Giovanni, maybe this is a good time for you to chime in, because I know that you have had, because um, you have had a, kind of like an interesting um, way to fulfill the experiential learning requirement. Yeah, um, so my name is Giovanni Johnson, I'm a senior at SIG, and I'm doing a Spanish certificate. Um, but, uh, no, so I play receiver on the football team, and the football great, but I don't have to catch the ball. And <laughs> this summer, I wanted to do the Rice and Madrid study, and it was six weeks out of the summer, so I went to the application process and everything like that, and I, I told my coaches, I was like, okay, so I want to go to Madrid for six weeks of the summer, and they were like, yeah, no, you can't do that. Because we, we're here, we're doing training and stuff during the summer. So I um, talked to Uziris and Sam and try to figure out a way, so how can I do the experiential learning part? Because I've taken all the classes, uh, I'm ready to do the exam, I just need this last component of the certificate. And they told me about the 60 hours of volunteer. So this summer I interned at the Federal Reserve, and just if you're doing an internship, especially in Houston for Spanish, if you just talk to people around and say, what opportunities are there for me to speak Spanish and volunteer? And there is a huge demand for that. I'm not, I can't speak to other languages, but, um, especially in Houston, so I got in contact with uh, Baker Ripley and did some volunteering for them. Oh, and I'll plug y'all. So there's this 
app called Be My Eyes, and it's like you can set it to any language that you want to do. I think all, I think all of them that I've seen on the board, they have on the app. But the app is basically so people that speak a certain language and are blind will get on the app, and then they'll you log into the app and make an account, and then whenever you get calls, you'll get a notification like, hey, this person needs help, and you get on the app and you just like they'll ask you things. I got asked one time which of these words is red, which of these is green. Or just like different things needing help finding stuff around the house and you can get on that app. It's an easy way to log out. It's if you have some downtime, you just set your thing that active and then you'll just get calls that way. But definitely if the uh, studying abroad isn't an option for you or if you have any constraints of any kind, doing one of the options to, to complete the exponential learning. And just emailing. Uh, I know some of you, it was, they work for me a lot. So, so it's for that good reason. And if you're showing up here, you know, Thank you so much for joining me. Um, there are, to reiterate what uh, Giovanni said, there are so many ways you can consider the experiential learning component, also in this commonly taught languages. I understand that for language like Arabic or Korean or Chinese, it might be a little bit more difficult. We are currently working with our faculty to put together a list of NGOs or organizations in Houston that you can work with that we know do a good job and we'll be able to we'll work with them to prevent the language, um, the experiential learning component. Do you have any other questions? I know that we have a few people attending online. Do you guys have any questions? If so, feel free to unmute um, yourself and ask the question. Um, we, I didn't hear your question very well. Could you repeat or could you repeat it? If you still can't hear it, maybe you can type it in the chat box. Okay. We'll, we'll wait for you to type your question. Um, in the meantime, any other questions? Online or in person? Oh, <laughs> I tend to do that all. Well, in our classes, in the Arabic language class, we have very, very small classes. I'm usually just looking at the same three or four students. And they don't miss other students raising their hands. But go ahead. Um, I was actually thinking about first, like, Spanish 323, the internship downtime class. Does that count as for experiential learning and as a course? Yes, it does. Yes. Yeah. And what we have seen in the past is through that course, students usually accumulate around 40 hours. Uh, but you could, you could do more than 40 if you decide to um, in the course. Uh, or you could just, you know, finish <coughs> your course and then have extra 20 hours to put somewhere else. Uh, but yeah, so it would count for three credits for the course. It's three credits, Heather, right? 323? Yes, it's three, three credits, so that can count. And then if it counts as 40 hours of experiential learning, then you've got a big chunk of your experience and learning right. done, and you can just find another 20 hours. Yeah. And I know that someone here just told me about 323 that they are actually doing the full 60 hours in the course. So after they have fulfilled the number of hours required by the course, they are going to continue working in a way to, you know, and, and go to for the full 60 hours. And it will say so on the website. So there is an easy way. And we, we're not very, we are strict and rigorous, but we're not annoying when it comes to, oh, you've done 60 hours. Show me something to prove that you have done the 60 hours. You're bound by the uh, rice honor code, and we're not gonna be asking you to do the impossible. Uh, you know, send us emails from the organization that you work with, and it has to be signed by the CEO, or like, you no. Know, uh, we work with what you have to make sure that you have met this requirement and complete and completed it successfully. Any yeah. other questions? Yes. And on this, so if you're graduating this fall, then we're gonna get you the results in time for your graduation. If you are not 
then we're not going to wait until the spring, until the end of the spring. So you only have, you have two testing periods, but only one grading period. So we will take assessments that we're taking in the fall and those that we're taking in the spring and grade all of them at the end of the spring. And we typically start grading um, after the last day of um, instruction, so um, it will be after, I don't know, April 23rd or, or 21st for, for this academic year, um, 2023. And typically, how long is that? It's just like two or three weeks until we release the... Yeah. So we will, yeah, we will, I will email the instructor that has to grade your test and we'll um, follow up with them so that your um, grade is ready within two or three weeks. Other questions? Questions in the chat. Oh yeah, of course. Thank you for being the unofficial facilitator of. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. Um, yes, as I said, there are two testing periods. So I will read the question. It says I'm graduating next May. So that's May 2023. Can I also take the exam in April? Yes, you should take the exam in April. Um, uh, so, you, yes, you can definitely take the exam in April, and um, the exam will open towards the end of March. Um, it will be available on Canvas until April 21st, the last day of instruction, uh, which is, so you have 30 days to take the test. Did I answer your question? <laughs> okay, perfect. So there is so much suspense. Right? Any other questions? Well, thank you guys so much for coming to this event and for being interested in taking um, the CLIP certificate. Um, I took the liberty of writing down the, all the languages that we offer um, here at Click. And this is not required for done with the information session. However, if you wish to go join a group of your peers who are pursuing the certificate, you want to get to know them, meet them, see how they're doing, what kind of coursework they have done, what kind of issues they're having, um, then feel free to do so. But you're not required to do it. And finally, I want to show you one last time my email. Um, so this is my email right here. And you can um, shoot me an email if you have any questions. Or if you have several questions and prefer to read over Zoom or in person. Right, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.